setting a harsh campaign tone. She's a world-class liar. Donald Trump takes direct aim at Hillary Clinton. What changed Marco's mind? The Florida lawmaker now wants to stay in the U.S. Senate. The GOP's new medical plan, how it compares with Obamacare. And refugees take center stage. The Pope places them in the spotlight. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, June 22nd, 2016. Good evening from Washington. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Dueling speeches today from Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. The presidential candidates spar over everything from jobs to religion. Chief White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn begins our team coverage. Brian, the goal of Trump's speech today appeared to be uniting the Republican Party and appealing to people who are skeptical of him but vigorously oppose Hillary Clinton. And the presumptive Republican nominee says he's best positioned to address Americans' economic interests. Hillary Clinton may be the most corrupt person ever to seek the presidency of the United States. Donald Trump slammed Hillary Clinton on trade policy, saying she hurts American workers. And he linked Clinton to the rise of ISIS and the death of Ambassador Christopher Stevens in Benghazi when she was Secretary of State. The Hillary Clinton foreign policy has cost America thousands of lives and trillions and trillions of dollars and unleashed ISIS across the world. Trump's own policies have been under siege recently, but today he described himself as a humble entrepreneur who can create jobs. We can come back bigger and better and stronger than ever before. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Trump also made a direct appeal to supporters of Bernie Sanders, urging them to help him fix a rigged system. And today, some pro-life leaders who met with Trump Tuesday said they'd like to keep talking. I'd love to come back to him and have a deeper conversation, not just about the issue of abortion, but specifically on government funding for Planned Parenthood. We spend about a half a billion dollars a year in tax dollars, and we strongly at Concerned Women for America believe that we can shift that funding to community health centers so that we can still care for poor women without the taint of abortion. Evangelicals held the closed-door meeting with Trump yesterday in New York. Meanwhile, presumptive nominee Hillary Clinton is shoring up her support among Democratic leadership. Jason Calvi is on Capitol Hill with the latest. Jason. Lauren, Hillary Clinton back here at the Capitol for the first time since she clinched the Democratic nomination, meeting behind closed doors with House Democrats. Inside, she was greeted with chants of Hillary, Hillary. Hey, good morning. How are you? Hillary Clinton making big promises to Democrats. We are going to win this election. We're going to take back the House and the Senate. And to do that, Democratic congressmen say Clinton is promising to campaign in all 50 states, even though she has been focusing on the usual battleground states. She is going to go to every corner of the country. Congressman Javier Bucera has been rumored as a possible vice presidential pick. Are you actually being vetted right now? I have no knowledge of that. But his House colleagues say he should be on the list. I'm, I'm sure he's going to be vetted. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he's chosen. Other possible names include Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's campaigning with Clinton on Monday, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine, and HUD Secretary Julian Castro. Today, Bernie Sanders tells C-SPAN that it doesn't appear he'll be the nominee, but he urges Clinton to pick a liberal running mate. Clinton has struggled to win over the young and liberal voters who supported Sanders. Conservatives criticize her, too. I don't have no reason to attack her faith. I just question her ability to defend my right, my family's right, my church's right to practice our faith in the public square. Donald Trump told Christians yesterday that the public doesn't know anything about Hillary in terms of religion, but today Clinton cited her Methodist religion, and pro-lifers jumped in too. One thing that is very true is that, um, is that her church, the Methodist church, has moved away from her abortion position. Clinton still has a lot of work to do to shore up the Sanders supporters. The Bloomberg poll out this week shows that Sanders supporters, 22% of them say they will vote for Donald Trump 
and 18 percent of Sanders supporters say they will vote for the Libertarian candidate Gary Johnson. Donald Trump himself will be here at the Capitol meeting with House Republicans after the July 4th recess. Brian? Thanks. Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Marco Rubio now wants to keep his Florida Senate seat. The former Republican presidential candidate says today he will run for re-election. In reversing his plans to retire, the first-term senator says control of the Senate could come down to the race in Florida. That could mean the future of the Supreme Court and other critical issues. Rubio has been under intense pressure from party leaders to seek re-election. House Democrats try a new tactic in their fight for gun control. We will occupy this floor. We will no longer be denied a right to vote. The lawmakers staged a sit-in demanding a vote on gun control legislation. Sit they sat down, reading names expired. of victims of gun violence to visitors. We have lost hundreds and thousands of innocent people to gun violence. Their sit-in effectively Tiny. halts legislative business in the U.S. Sure. House of Representatives. We're learning more about the gunman responsible for the Orlando terror attack. Investigators say Omar Mateen visited the nightclub hours before the shooting spree. He reportedly paid the cover charge and he went inside. At some point, he left, then returned two hours later to carry out his planned massacre, killing 49 people. The man who killed Christina Grimmie reportedly developed a fixation with the young singer who competed on NBC's The Voice. A friend says um, Kevin Loibel spent most of his time watching Grimmie on YouTube and monitoring her social media accounts. Police say Loibel shot and killed himself after killing Grimmie as she signed autographs in Orlando June 11th. Former House Speaker Dennis Hastert reports to federal prison in Minnesota this afternoon. He's serving a 15-month sentence in a hush money case. It included revelations that Hastert sexually abused at least four boys while working as a high school wrestling coach in Illinois. Hastert is one of the highest-ranking U.S. politicians ever to go to prison. Michigan's Attorney General sues two companies, blaming them for Flint's lead-tainted water crisis. That suit claims the actions and omissions of the companies hired by the state and city caused the crisis to occur, continue, and worsen. Two months ago, the state filed criminal charges against two state environmental regulators and a water employee of the city of Flint. Flint's drinking water was switched from the Detroit system to the Flint River in 2014. The water was not properly treated. That resulted in corrosion of lead pipes and elevated lead levels in some children. A federal judge declines to block a Mississippi law allowing county clerks to refuse issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples based on their religious beliefs. State attorneys say it's a reasonable accommodation to protect religious freedom. Now, today's ruling applies to just one of the four separate challenges to that law. The U.S. Education Department says a South Carolina school district will allow a transgender elementary student to use the girls' restroom. The department's Office for Civil Rights says the district's earlier refusal violated Title IX. That protects students from sex-based discrimination. Religious freedom advocates say Title IX offers equal rights for boys and girls, but was never intended to address gender identity issues. The Obama administration says California did not violate a religious freedom law by ordering health insurance companies to pay for abortions. The state's 2014 order requires seven insurance companies to rescind policies that don't cover elective abortions, even though those policies cover workers at Catholic universities and other organizations objecting to abortion on moral grounds. House Republicans unveil a new proposal to repeal and replace Obamacare. Speaker Paul Ryan calls the Affordable Care Act fundamentally flawed. Instead of forcing people to buy insurance, Ryan wants insurance companies to compete for business. For six years now, six years, we've promised to repeal and replace Obamacare and make health care actually affordable. Well, here it is. A real plan in black and white right here. We are officially putting it on the table. The way I see it, if we don't like the direction the country is going, and we don't, then we have an obligation, a duty to offer an alternative. It is our duty to offer a better way. 
And that's what this is. The Republican plan uses tax credits to allow people to buy coverage from private insurers. It also promotes medical liability reform and expands access to health savings accounts. The White House says Ryan doesn't get credit for writing a white paper, adding he had Republican support if he had it. He would put it for a vote. Well, James Capretta is an expert in American health care policy. He worked in the White House, the Senate, and House on Health Care, now researching how to replace Obamacare with a less expensive plan. You moderated a session this afternoon among the task force members on this health care proposal. What do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of this GOP plan? Well, I think the strength is in part of the description you just read, which is that the, the plan has a, uh, everybody in America would have access to health insurance under this plan. Either you would have employer coverage, and if you don't get an offer of a of plan from your employer, then you would get a tax credit. Uh, or you would be on Medicare if you're an elderly person, or if you're very low income, you'd be on Medicaid. Between those four programs, everybody in the United States would have access to affordable health insurance. And this is under a Republican plan. So I think that's the most important feature of it. Uh, the second, the weakness may be that there are some details left out. They need to flesh out a few details, and, but they have time to do that. It doesn't need to be all worked out at this point, but it's a pretty comprehensive plan, and it's, it's I, I think, enough there to understand what it would do. Does it have broad support among Republicans? Today's event had the Speaker of the House, the Majority Whip, the number three person in the House, and four of the, the four chairmen who have jurisdiction over health care. They were the primary authors of this plan, uh, but th they wouldn't have put it out if they hadn't had many, many discussions with the rank-and-file House Republican members. It's clear to me that if they start to move legislation, this will be the starting point. And if they, had to, if they can't have an opportunity to pass something, it'll look like this. So the White House sort of mocked Ryan, saying if he had support for this, why doesn't he put it for a vote? Why? Well, look, I mean, obviously with President Obama in the White House, a bill is never going to get two-thirds majority, which is what you would need to override a presidential veto. There's never going to be repeal and replace while the president is sitting in, the current president is in the White House. So it would be pointless to really go through the effort. The, uh, it would be a very highly charged environment. So they're doing the right thing, putting out a plan, waiting for the election, and then seeing what happens next year. How would you characterize Obamacare now six years into it? Well, look, I mean, it's, it's met a goal in a certain sense. It expanded insurance coverage to a certain segment of the low-income population, but mainly through expanding the Medicaid program. Most of the newly insured people uh, under Obamacare are people that are now in Medicaid, which is the program for low-income Americans, which is uh, something that is not, it, it is lower quality care than mainstream insurance through uh, employers that people, most people are in today. And so it's not the greatest option. And so, I, you know, frankly, I think we could do better than that. You know, if we want to try to make sure everybody in the United States has access to quality health care, we can't have every, so many people on Medicaid. Well, at least there is an alternative plan now on the table. Jim Capretta, we always appreciate your time. Thanks for being with us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Coming up, a surprise in St. Peter's Square as Pope Francis openly advocates for refugees. And we look at how ripple effects of tomorrow's Brexit vote in the UK might impact the world. El cristiano Exclude nessuno da posto a tutti. Lascia venire, venire tutti. The Holy Father inviting a dozen refugees to join him on the steps of St. Peter's for his general audience today. Then he makes a passionate plea for them. Alan Holdren, Rome Bureau Chief for EWTN's Catholic News Agency, joining us from Rome. Alan, what was it the Pope said? The Pope was saying, uh, Brian, that, that the Christian excludes no one, that these refugees are our brothers, that there's space for them, and the Christian allows them to come in. So this is classic Francis, passionate, spontaneous. But isn't there some pushback? Uh, isn't there anti-immigrant sentiment there in Italy and all of Europe? I think in a lot of places you find a little bit of everything, the whole spectrum. Uh, you, you hear a lot from political leaders on the right and the left speaking about the immigration issue and taking different sides. 
On the streets here in Rome, we see a lot of refugees. We see a lot of immigrants, people with no documents, who are often selling things here on the street. There's a lot of compassion for them. Pope Francis spoke about that this morning. He said, in addition to that compassion and to the generosity of giving money, uh, that we should also reach out to the poor and touch them. I think that's the great difficulty, the great challenge that Europe has today, is, is responding to that in a way that, that truly helps these refugees. I think this is a, a difficulty that Pope Francis speaks to often. Alan, I'm curious, this move to bring these refugees up to the steps of St. Peter, was that spontaneous or do you think that was pre-planned? Well, Brian, I watched it again uh, and again. I watched it three times just to see what the dynamic was. And Pope Francis, he, he would have seen them, as far as we know, when he was coming out into the audience, uh, into the square. And then he would have made some sort of signal for them to come forward because they were there to meet him as he got out of the Pope Mobile after greeting and blessing people in the square after about 15 minutes. He was walking up towards the stage and he invited them to come with him. It looked, it looked like they were going with him. Uh, one of our correspondents spoke to the group afterwards and a representative said that it was a spontaneous gesture that Pope Francis really did just want them up there with him. And they sat on the ground right in front of him, as you may have seen. Very interesting. Alan Holdren, Rome correspondent for Catholic News Agency. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Brian. And North Korea causes more global alarm with another missile launch. It fired ballistic missile with a range reaching U.S. allies and military bases in Japan and South Korea. Earlier launch attempts failed, but North Korea seems to be improving its technology despite U.N. sanctions. Well, tomorrow, British voters finally weigh in on whether or not the U.K. should leave the European Union. Wyatt Goolsby reports from the British Embassy here in Washington. Wyatt? Brian, the latest polls indicate that the referendum vote is too close to call in many parts of the UK. Opinions are split as to whether they want to stay in or leave the EU, and it's a decision that has worldwide consequences. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Last minute campaigning is underway as both the Remain and the Leave camp work to gain voter support. Prime Minister David Cameron is against Britain's exit, also called Brexit. If we want a bigger economy and more jobs, we're better if we do it together. If we want to fight climate change, we're better if we do it together. If we want to win against the terrorists and keep our country safe, we're better if we do it together. Cameron touts his support from numerous political parties, trade unions and businesses, but not everyone agrees. The former mayor of London, Boris Johnson, is campaigning against the UK's participation in the 28-nation bloc. It's out of control. You've got the European Court of Justice telling us what to do about all sorts of stuff, who we can have on our streets, uh, human rights, divorce law, whether you're entitled to set up a school or not. Johnson highlights the United Kingdom's fishing business as one that has been hit hard the last several decades. Most fishermen blame EU quotas for their woes. The chief of the NATO military alliance says Britain's remaining in the European Union is key for transatlantic security in fighting violent extremism. The president of the European Commission warns if the UK votes out, there is no going back. After months of bitter rhetoric, Britons on both sides say they're not happy at how the debate has all played out. I think it's a shame actually that it's, it's got this way and it's um, not really given us all of the facts. It's just been a lot of mudslinging. Both sides have, have put out um, fairly propaganda filled campaigns, which I think is unfortunate because I think that there are, there are very many facts there, so they've clouded the issue. A number of EU nations, including the leaders of Germany and Poland, say they want Britain to remain part of the EU. They say it's better for their trade agreements on for all parties. However, they like, just like the leader of NATO, say that ultimately this is a decision that's up to British voters. Brian? All right, thank you. Wyatt Goolsby at the British Embassy here in D.C. And some Catholics in Britain who support Brexit say the EU imposes its secularism on member nations. British Catholic writer and historian Joanna Bogle says it's a very divisive issue. I can't honestly say that Catholics in general are concerned about the EU. Catholics in Britain are confused and divided, as is everyone else. Myself, I'm not sure the European Union will impose a secular agenda. We have plenty of that homegrown. But what it is certainly not going to do is make it any easier uh, to be living actively and enthusiastically and joyfully as a Catholic. Bogle says she's voting for Brexit because she thinks the EU is out of date, dishonest, and bureaucratic. Up next, a daring rescue at the end of the Earth, what it took to arrive at the South Pole, and military controversy. 
An Air Force veteran is dragged out of a ceremony for a reference to God in his speech. Today is the memorial of St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher. They were martyred in 1535 for refusing to acknowledge King Henry VIII as the supreme head of the church in England. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Well, a dangerous rescue at the bottom of the earth, so to speak. A small plane picks up two workers who got sick at the remote U.S. science South Pole outpost. Temperatures there around 75 degrees below zero. Normally, planes don't go to the South Pole at this time of year. It can be very dangerous flying in the pitch dark and frigid cold. The plane took the patients 1,500 miles to a British research station on the Antarctic Peninsula before refueling and then continuing to South America for continued medical care. Lawyers for a decorated Air Force veteran demand justice. They say he was assaulted, kicked off the Air Force base over the use of the word God in a patriotic speech. Retired Sergeant Oscar Rodriguez, Jr., tried to deliver a flag-folding speech at a retirement ceremony on Travis Air Force Base near Sacramento. Watch as uniformed airmen physically drag him off. He claims he was kicked off the base because his speech included the word God. Ken Klukowski, senior counsel for First Liberty, the law firm representing Sergeant Rodriguez, is here tonight. So why was he so forcibly removed from this private retirement ceremony? Well, Brian, the lieutenant commander who commands the squadron from which this other man was retiring, a man who had heard uh, Mr. Rodriguez give his speech before, asked, can you please give those remarks at my retirement speech? Uh, when this commanding officer found out, he made it clear that he did not want those remarks said. They were even, gonna, they were even putting up warning signs saying, warning, God will be mentioned during this speech. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a retiree's prerogative as to what they want in their retirement ceremony. Mr. Rodriguez is retired after 33 years of honorable service. He's a decorated veteran. He was there as a private citizen, along with many other private citizens. At the appointed time, he took his position. He started to give his speech, and four uniformed airmen seized him and forcibly dragged him out as he was given his speech. So the Constitution protects our rights to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. How can the U.S. Air Force do this? Well, and the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. When a government agent grabs you, they better have an arrest warrant or some sort of special circumstances. There's also a Fifth Amendment issue here. The bottom line is, under the U.S. Constitution, they can't. There's also federal statutes like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and other federal laws that are implicated by this. This is just flatly illegal any way you look at it. And thank God we have this video, so there's no question as to what the facts were on the day in question. What is the reaction from the Air Force? Has there been any? Uh, it's th their, their reaction is forthcoming uh, at this point. In fact, we've seen two separate one-sentence statements that contradict each other. One saying that uh, he was given a, an unapproved uh, speech and therefore that that could not happen. But also uh, a separate spokesman from a different unit said that these are pri that private speech is allowed at these events, including religious references. So uh, on Monday, First Liberty uh, sent a demand letter to the U.S. Air Force uh, reciting the facts, listing the provisions of the U.S. Constitution and federal law that had been violated, we are giving them until Monday to issue a formal written apology, to acknowledge their unlawful behavior, to give a written promise that Mr. Rodriguez can return at any time on the base to engage in constitutionally protected speech, and to hold accountable and appropriately punish those responsible for this. If they don't uh, meet all of those uh, requirements by Monday, then, uh, then we'll have to take the next step. Putting it on them. The, the facts are at firstliberty.org. If your viewers want to check it out and see the video, you really can't make this stuff up, Brian. I saw the video. Firstliberty.org. Ken Klukowski, thanks for being with thanks us. Thanks for having me. And finally tonight, Pope Francis reveals today he prays this short prayer before he goes to bed at night. Lord, if you want, you can purify me. He then prays five Our Fathers, one for each wound of the crucified Christ. Francis says we can do this too in our homes, and Jesus will always listen to us. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to leave you with more images from today's general audience in St. Peter's Square. Good night. God bless you.